Like, if I wasn't as involved in how terrible the government is, and someone told me this, like just the, a, the average normal person out there walking around is told this, their first reaction is either, I don't believe it, or this must be just some kind of rare rogue aberration. No, this is the system. Spike, thank you so much for joining me today. I am happy to be here, Artie. Thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, so you were a 2020 VP candidate for the Libertarian Party. And I want to talk about that a little bit, but uh, one of the main focuses I want to talk about is your nonprofit, You Are the Power. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to say before we get started? A little bit about yourself, background? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, I uh, I was the 2020 Libertarian VP candidate, or as I like to say it, I was the vice presidential bronze medalist. I, we came in third. Uh, we worked hard for it. Uh, but um, my background before that, I, I started my first business when I was 16, and uh, I was in the uh, small business slash startup world for the better part of 20 years. Um, and then after a, uh, a diagnosis of MS, I retired from that, took a little break for a while to kind of retool things because I clearly wasn't being very healthy with my life. And uh, then when I got back into doing stuff, I decided I wanted to focus on kind of giving back and helping others. And that led to me getting into political activism, which led to me being the VP candidate. And now with my uh, my nonprofit, You Are the Power, we we find people that are being abused and uh, and uh, frankly attacked by their corrupt local and state governments. And uh, we organize and fight for them to uh, get the justice they deserve and for those corrupt officials to back off of them. And we don't stop fighting until we win. I love it. I believe your diagnosis with MS was 2016, somewhere around there, right? I was officially diagnosed in 2016. I had my first confirmed uh, what they call flare-up or exacerbation in uh, 2014. In retrospect, I was probably dealing with it at least a couple of years prior to that. So I've been uh, officially dealing with it. Uh, I actually just had my, uh, back in March, my 10-year anniversary of my original flare-up. Uh, but I've probably been dealing with it for the better part of 10 or 12 years. But yeah, I had that official diagnosis. Uh, uh, the MS diagnosis can, uh, I think that's a little faster now, but back then it was not uncommon for it to take the better part of two years to get an official diagnosis. I mean, that's a pretty heavy diagnosis to have to deal with. Like, why? How did you go from that diagnosis to, I want to go into politics a bit like it seems like the last thing you should do after a diagnosis <laughs> so i would say so um when i was diagnosed that was actually a bit of a relief because it was it sort of ended this two year limbo period of not being sure if i had ms being kind of sure i had ms and just knowing that i was in the hospital more and more often and you know, uh, um, for those who don't know, MS is an autoimmune disease that attacks your nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord. And so if you think of, you know, your your brain and spinal cord are attached to everything. So the symptoms of MS are pretty much everything, anything neurological. And I was having a lot of them. I was getting all sorts of shooting pains and uh, uh, transient weakness in my limbs and just all sorts of dizziness and fatigue and all sorts of terrible stuff. And it was getting worse and worse and worse. So when 2016 rolled around, I was actually relieved to have a diagnosis because that meant I could finally start getting treatment. It was then that I really got hit with the wake up call because I had spent the last two years. All I thought about was, do I have MS? Do I, you know, what's my future going to look like? Can I get over this? I want to fight back against this MS. I want to be healthy. I want to want this to be like, I don't have MS. Hopefully I don't have MS. And, um, when I sat down with the neurologists and the MS specialists and they were going over my options for treatment, they said, you know, the goal of your treatment for this MS, we've really come a long way with this stuff. We're going to make it, once we find the right treatment, it will slow down the, the progression of your MS so that it's indiscernible from the aging process. Hmm. That hit me like a, that was supposed to make me feel better. Yeah. But what it did was it hit me like a ton of bricks because I realized, whoa, 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 wait a second. Even if I didn't have MS, I have that 100% fatal thing that everyone has, which is called mortality, where you slowly decline over time and then eventually you're not here anymore. I had been so focused on this possible disease that I might have that I forgot that we only have a certain number of seconds that we're going to be here, even if we're the, the absolute healthiest, even if we're in the best shape ever, even if we live longer than anyone else did before us, we're eventually going to decline. 
and we're eventually not even going to be here. Very cheery stuff, I know, for your show. But the point that what, what I walked away from that with is I'm going to live the hell out of this life. And so, yes, I focused primarily on getting my health under control. I got on a really good diet and exercise regimen, supplementation, mindfulness and meditation, all sorts of stuff. I'm in the best health of my, of my life and I, I get healthier by the day. I, um, I, I got my MS under control with a combination of that and the treatment that they put me on. I've been in remission now for uh, coming up on seven years. But I, more importantly than all of that, MS in retrospect was a gigantic blessing. Because it was the wake up call that nothing else was ever going to get through to me other than a serious life changing illness. So, you know, God or the universe or whatever you want to call it knew that my head was hard enough that it was going to take something like an as yet incurable neurodegenerative disorder to make me actually take this thing seriously. And, uh, and it has. I, I, I not only realized I was at a point where I needed to stop worrying, I, I really didn't have to worry about finances anymore because of the work I had done up until then. So that's a blessing that I also had. And yeah. so I thought, okay, well, then what do I want to do? I want it to have mattered that I was here because eventually I wasn't, I won't be here. And I want the fact that I was here to have been a good thing for everyone else around me. Um, without going into a whole, I, I went down this whole metaphysical journey about why we're even here and what the purpose of that is. But I'll give you the very short version, which is that the only thing I can walk away with is that the fact that I have this extremely fleeting and incredibly rare gift of having ever been here at all is something that I have to ex express the most immense uh, and undy undying gratitude for. And that the best way I can demonstrate that gratitude is the way that I treat myself and others. And so that is kind of been my, my, uh, uh, my directive moving forward. Um, and so that's what I do with you with the power. That's what I do with my activism is I'm finding people who are suffering and I try to not just alleviate their suffering, but look at the root causes of that suffering and organize the rest of us around ending that suffering at its root so that we can have less suffering and more harmony and more prosperity and more happiness. Yeah, well, government definitely definitely causes a lot of suffering in the world yes. in general. When it seems like a pretty quick transition to you know stop your other business in 2016 and then end up as a VP candidate, which I know you didn't really <laughs> want to do, uh, and I'm sure there's probably some frustration with being linked to that, even though it's not something that you really wanted to do in the first place. Like that kind of people know you as the VP candidate in 2020. Yeah. Why was the transition from just getting involved to VP? Why was that so quick? Uh, I think it just is a testament to how I operate. Uh, I don't do anything in moderation. Um, so uh, when I got decided to get into business, I became a serial entrepreneur. I was constantly uh, you know, working on my existing companies, working on startups, being involved with other people's stuff, helping people with other things. Like it was just, I was a workaholic. And then for a brief period of time, uh, the better part of 10 years between uh, 13 in my early to mid twenties. Um, you know, I was like other kids. I would, you know, get high occasionally. Well, that turned into a full blown multi drug addiction. Mm. Uh, and I eventually had to, uh, to just give all of it up. I, I could not, I tried doing it in moderation. That didn't work. I was either going to be a drug addict or a teetotaler. And so I've been uh, sober for, uh, right around 18 years now. And, mm -hmm. um, so I, everything I do is just, I'm either doing it like the, the most important thing I've ever done, or I'm not doing it. And right. so, you know, I thought, eh, maybe I'll get into politics. And so, you know, th that very quickly turned into what it turned into. Um, when I ran, you, you kind of alluded to this. When I ran for the VP nomination in 2020, I thought of it as more of, you know, I I'm looking at how the Libertarian Party's operating, how we're messaging, how we're running campaigns. And coming from my background in small businesses and in startups, I'm seeing all the problems with messaging. I'm seeing all of the, and it's not they weren't trying or that they were doing things necessarily bad. I was just seeing some kind of glaring gaps that, that weren't happening, you know? And so I, as sort of a proof of concept, I, uh, I you know, did, ran what I considered a fairly satirical campaign for the, for the vice presidential nomination. And by satirical, I mean, my proposed running mate was Vermin Supreme, the guy who wears a boot on his head and promises yeah. everyone's free ponies. And I'm standing next to him and I've got one of those like, those, you know, horse heads on a stick that kids you would play with, you know, to pretend that they're riding a horse. And I'm waving it around like a scepter. Like I, I was 
I was very much saying, I don't expect anyone to nominate me here, but I would, you know, I'd have all my satirical stuff that I talk about, but I would also have a serious message behind it. Like, okay, now that I've got your attention, uh, and since we're all on the same page here that you're going to pick someone else to be your VP nominee, um, I do want to talk to you about what I think we could be doing differently. Well, clearly I sold that well because they, they didn't care about the pony stick and they didn't care about the, uh, the, uh, you know, my, my, my running mate and all that. They said, uh, yeah, we're going to pick you for VP. And so I went, okay, well then, you know, you, you've given me this opportunity. I'm going to take it and run with it. And that's exactly what I did. And I, I hit the ground running, visited close to 40 States in a five month period. Once I got the nomination and, uh, in doing that, I realized this is my first step into greater activism within the Libertarian Party. Usually it goes the other way. You do years of activism in the Libertarian Party and in the Libertarian movement, and then you work your way up to that. I did this weird cheat code thing. And then uh, and I said, but I'm not going anywhere after this. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take this and the platform that it's affording me, and I'm going to, you know, hit the ground running. As I was doing so, I realized long before we need to be talking about you know, getting people elected or party politics, we need to change the culture. Most people don't want freedom or too much freedom, right? They've been conditioned that it's bad. They've actually been conditioned to go against their intrinsic expectation of other human beings to respect them as an individual human being, which they themselves respect other people as individual human beings. They, they have this weird set aside whenever it's the government, which is literally just people who have called themselves the government. And so where they would usually res- expect that other people would respect them as individual human beings and not harm them or, or rob them or threaten them or coerce them, when it's the government, suddenly they're okay with it. Or they might not be okay with it, but they treat it differently than if someone just walked up to them and said, give me all your money and I'll decide if I'm going to give any of it back to you. And so, uh, you know, that's what led to you where the power was instead of arguing with people or trying to get them to vote for us in our, in our, you know, our, our, um, our, uh, kind of last ditch or, or long shot campaigns. Instead, I'm showing them examples of government abuse and I'm giving them a call to action to join me to do something about it and to join us in continuing to do something about it. And in doing so, giving them an opportunity to hear our message through activism that they themselves immediately endorse and engage with, with us. That's what we do at You Are the Power. Yeah, you mentioned uh, respect, and I know you've talked about respect a lot, and it's a, it's a really important concept. What is respect? The respect I'm talking about here isn't the kind of respect that you and I, I might have for each other. You know, I respect what you're doing with your show, or I respect what you're doing with your journalism, or you might respect what I'm doing or my opinion on something or what I'm doing with you or the power. I'm talking about the intrinsic, unspoken respect that every non-sociopathic, non-psychopathic human being has for every other individual human being. It is the reason that you are able to go about your day surrounded mostly by total strangers and have a reasonable expectation that no one's going to just randomly walk up and harm you. It's not that way because of the government or because of law enforcement. It's that way because we understand and actually expect have a reasonable expectation that everyone there is going to treat us differently than they would treat a cockroach that they'd walk by and not care if they accidentally step on or not. Or if they don't step on it, it's because they don't want to mess their shoes up, not because they care about the cockroach. We have this sort of intrinsic, to the point of not even really thinking about it, respect for one another as individual human beings. When someone says it's wrong to hurt people, it's wrong to rob people, it's wrong to kill people, it's wrong to threaten people, and then someone says, well, why is it? We very often have a hard time answering that, or we might default to, uh, well, because my religion or my faith tells me that. Okay, but why? Why does your God not want you to do that? The unspoken, and and again, because it's so intrinsic, we often aren't even thinking of it. The answer is because we are individual human beings and you would never do that to one another. This is something a child understands until they're deconditioned of it. And so uh, it's a lot easier, for example, to convince a a child that taxation is wrong than an adult. Because an adult has all of that conditioning of, well, but, you know, the government needs it to do this and that. And so what we're doing with our causes is we're saying, listen. If we're to have a government, it needs to follow the exact same intrinsic rules that we have for everyone else because they're literally just people just like we are. And so it should be respect. They 
those people in those positions should be respecting us as individual human beings the same way that we would expect them to do so outside of their capacity as a government official. And we demonstrate that with these causes that we find. And we can talk about a few examples, but you know, various examples of people whose lives are intentionally being harmed and sometimes destroyed by government officials because those government officials see them as an opportunity to grandstand on a political statement or an opportunity for, you know, some perverse incentive for funding, or they want their land, so they're going to steal it from them. They see them as an opportunity and something that's in their way, an obstacle that's in their way of, of more money, more power, more, uh, you know, more control, whatever. They don't see them as an individual human being and they would, that they would never dream to do that to. Or if they do, they've in their own head set aside that expectation that they respect them as a human being and go, well, I'm just doing my job. And so what we do is not only do we give people these examples of these terrible things that are happening, and not only do we give them a call to action to help us in putting an end to it and helping these people so that it's not happening to them anymore, but in doing so, we are consistently messaging to them that the root cause of this is that an, a set aside happened there where people were not respecting each other as individual human beings. And that when that individual human respect is there, this does not happen. I call it the principle of human respect. To whatever degree we are respected as an individual human being and we respect others as individual human beings, we have a proportionately higher or lower level of, uh, of prosperity, harmony, and respect. When we have that res or, uh, and, and happiness, when we have that respect, we have more prosperity, more harmony, and more uh, happiness. And when we don't have that respect, then we have less prosperity, less uh, harmony, and more unhappiness. I, I agree with that completely. I, it's interesting because it seems like the political atmosphere in the United States and probably worldwide in, in a lot of different countries is it pushes dehumanization, which is the opposite yep. of, of the respect that you're talking about, because you're talking about respecting the basic humanity of other people. Yeah. Why is that? Like, I mean, you go to a city council meeting and they're annoyed that they have to listen to the people that they are supposed to represent, complain yep. to them about the things that they're supposed to be fixing. And yep. you, you look at the news and you see people, I mean, the two main parties in the US, the dominant parties, they'll constantly dehumanize the other people, you know, Democrats will call Republicans, whatever dehumanizing words, yep. Republicans yep. will do it to Democrats. Yep. And this is pushed constantly. Why is that? Like, why is the respect that you're talking about? Why isn't that the norm? Because dehumanization, factionalization, uh, divisiveness, and conflict is a necessary component of politics. So government at its core, when you strip away all the, all the, the pageantry and the flags and the theme songs and the official titles and the fancy marble buildings and the statues and everything, government is essentially a monopoly of power, a self-imposed uh, uh, monopoly of power that pre-assumes its power. It says, uh, the people that came before us wrote this document that says we have this power, therefore we have this power. So it pre-assumes that it has this power. And if you were to come up with some uh, you know, competing document saying, actually, I think we have the power, they'd consider you a traitor and they'd probably kill you. And so it's, it's sort of this like, well, we have this document, it says we have the power, so, so, so we have the power. And the, this monopoly is uh, financed through extortion. They take money from you with the understanding that if you don't give them the money, things are going to be tough. So it's like kind of like a, a almost like a protection racket. Um, and it is enforced through violence and threats of violence, hmm. uh, through arresting people, which is essentially kidnapping, through, uh, you know, uh, using uh, people out there in force, uh, you know, physical violence if necessary, or hmm. threats of physical violence, or more extortion. They're going to fine you. They're going to issue fees against you and, and interest on those fines and fees. So it's more extortion, which is a form of yeah. violence. And so it's basically a protection racket with a flag and a theme song. And putting aside the morality of that, which I think it's very clearly that, that that's neither a moral nor ethical way of organizing people, there's no reason for them to do the right thing. Like all the, uh, you know, when you go to a store or when you're having a service provider provide a service to you and they're not doing a good job, you find another one. 
or you just opt out and do it yourself. But if there's a monopoly that not only says there's no one else in town that can provide these services, but you have to pay for it either way, and if you don't, we're going to make things rough for you, well, that removes any of the, the feedback loops that would cause them to want to improve their services. You're going to have to pay them regardless. You can't opt out and use someone else's services regardless. So not only do they have no incentive to do things better, but if they can make you suffer more and convince you it's because they don't have enough money, they don't have enough power, you, they don't have enough compliance from you, then it actually is a perverse incentive for them to allow things to be worse or in some cases to make things worse so that they can grandstand off of your suffering and leverage it to make things even to, to take even more from you and to make you think, well, this is just this is why we need a government. Look at all this chaos. And meanwhile, it's them that have either created or allowed this chaos to fester. Um, and so going back to your question about divisiveness, that's baked into it because what they say is, well, uh, we're not completely in charge. You're in charge. You get to decide who's up there. And of course, they completely game that system to make sure you only have one or two actual choices. Um, but what happens is they say, we're going to give you this democratic component. Well, what's democracy? It is a system of conflict whereby you and I decide whether I win or you win. Well, the way that we do that is even if we are, the first thing we have to do is find our differences. If I have to com convince people to vote for me or my party or my side over you or your party or your side, the first thing I have to do is find out what's different between us. So even if we're 95% similar, even if we're 99.999% similar, I've got to find that 0.0001% of difference. I have to create a fault line by which we will fight on that difference. And I have to make sure people understand not only are you different on that fault line, but that that difference is an existential threat to everything we hold dear. I can't just say, I think I'm marginally better than Artie. I have to say Artie could destroy everything. If Artie's in charge, we won't even have a country anymore. No, you need me because I'm much better. And in doing so, We've created this fault line and then people fall on either side of the fault line, right? So they say either, oh no, I think it's Artie, uh, or no, I think it's Spike. And even though a lot of people deep down go, I don't know, Artie and Spike are roughly the same. Maybe there are some differences. Over time, the rhetoric becomes more and more hyperbolic and more and more adversarial, especially when you and I are engaging in the kabuki theater of calling each other the worst possible thing that, that could ever happen to this country, while simultaneously we continue to work together to screw everyone over. And in doing so, we're encouraging everyone else to act that way, too. And so this is part of that democratic component. In order to make it look like these people are actually not uh, victims of a system that is imposed on them, but rather participants in their civic duty to take part in this great experiment in government, we actually encourage them to engage in the very division that we need them to have in order to keep them distracted from the reality of what we do to them every single day. So it is not just a, a bug, it is an actual feature. It is a necessary component of politics. Yeah, and it's it's pretty disgusting too. I mean, we 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 live in a country in a world right now where you live right next door to somebody, and that's a similarity. You are very similar to the pair, people you live next door to. Typically, I mean, you even Usually, like the yes. same area, but yep. I mean, one person votes one way, another votes another, and they're taught to hate each other because of these divisive little differences. That yeah. if they actually had a conversation they'd realize they aren't so different They're It's just that they're positioned to be different. It's, it's pretty yeah. wild to me. And so, and so what ends up happening is you find over time, people say, well, you know, to be polite, you don't talk politics or religion. Do you know why they tell you you shouldn't talk politics? Because one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to end up at each other's throats over some marginal difference, whether you're voting for Republicrat the red republicrat or the blue republicrat, right? And so now someone who was your friend, and we sort of kind of like almost un intrinsically understand or, or have a gut understanding that this is a stupid thing to fight over. So let's just not even talk about it because deep down we know it's not actually an existential threat, whether you're on team red or team blue. It's just like really we're all playing this weird team sports thing. So we just rather not talk about it. Or, and this is the threat to power, if more and more people were talking in good faith, the average Republican 
and the average Democrat, and for that matter, the average Green Party voter, average Libertarian Party, average person that just doesn't vote, or average person that, you know, uh, writes in someone or just votes whoever seems like the most independent candidate each time, they'd find out there's a lot less that they disagree on than they think. And that's unacceptable. They need them to engage in the overall political theater of me being perfectly fine with my neighbor across the street who, you know, might be a Republican or a Democrat while going on the Internet saying Republicans and Democrats are everything that's wrong with this country. Right. That's they need me to do that because then I am a, a, a good warrior fighting on the fault line they created to keep us at each other's throats, to keep us uh, divided and distracted. It's easier to conquer us that way and to make us feel like you know, we deserve this government we have because we're the ones who voted for this. And the reality is they, they gamed it from the beginning. Yeah, they definitely gained, gamed it from the beginning. And it's, it's interesting. You, you mentioned extortion and things like that. When I look at the IRS and organizations like that, I see no difference between the IRS and the mafia other than one has the government backing it because the yeah. mafia comes up to you and says, Hey, you're doing a business, you're doing business and we have nothing to do with it, but we're going to take mm -hmm. a cut because you're in our area. That's all the IRS is doing and is saying, you're doing business in our jurisdiction. We're going to yeah. take a cut. You're not going to see what we do with the money. You have no control over that. Well, you better get it, give it to us. Otherwise we send the muscle. You know? I had a, a, you know, when I was, especially when I was more actively in business, uh, I would get these mailers. And it would say your it would say things like your business means a lot to you. Make sure that you're staying in compliance with our new such and such tool. And it was literally, you know, and the way they were presenting it is there's this new easy tool that will make it easier for you to pay your quarterly estimates and stuff like that. But what it was really saying is it's a real nice business you have here. Real shame if something were to happen to it. Like yeah. it literally started with saying you've worked hard for this small business. This business means a lot to you. Make sure you're in compliance. And it was, in, it was so assumed. I'm sure most people who saw that never even realized the connection there. And I'm sure the people who made the, 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 you know, the marketing tool never realized what they were actually saying because everyone's like, well, yeah, of course you don't want your business to get messed up because you didn't pay your taxes. They'll take everything from you. But they were literally saying it was, it was a more fancy way of saying nice thing you got here. Be a real shame if something were to happen to it. Maybe you should pay up so nothing does. And it was. I remember, and I mean, I, I would have been in my uh, late teens, early 20s when I was first seeing this stuff. And I, I immediately saw it for what it was. But that was also because my dad had been filling me with anti-government propaganda my entire life. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reading this and I'm like, this is a threat from the mob. Like, this is, this is discernibly no different than if someone walked in, if I had a storefront and someone walked in and started touching some of my more fragile stuff and going, uh, it'd be a real shame if a lot of this stuff started falling over. Anyway, we're going to start taking, you know, 50 bucks a week from you or, or however, you know, however much they want to take from you. That was literally what they were doing. It is a protection racket. Yeah. And it, it's crazy to me how people were conditioned to believe that somehow all of the problems that government causes is going to be solved by more government, by, <laughs> by reaching out to government and saying, hey, government, will you fix this problem that you caused? Yeah. But we're just we're just stuck in this trap of, of just not knowing how to get out of it. And why is that so difficult for people to grasp? Is it just complacency bias? Is it like things aren't too bad, so let's not rock the boat? There's some of that, but I think the overriding thing is that the vast majority of people believe that it's one side's fault. That government can be a tool for good. But that one side's using it for bad. And so the other side, if they get in, then they can use it for good. And then, of course, you know, when the other side gets in and they use it for bad, they go, well, those aren't real Republicans. They're rhinos. Those aren't yeah. real uh, Democrats. Those are paid off corporate dinos. And it's like, no, 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 those are Republicans and Democrats. That's literally what you voted for. And it is it's this weird thing. I remember seeing a tweet and this was a while back. I've used it many times. I wish I remember who said it. But, uh, you know, it's it's wild to watch people blame one half of the ruling class for everything that's happening and believe that the only people that can stop them are the other half of the ruling class. But that's literally what they're saying. They're saying, well, it's not the government. It's just this half of it or this part of it and not this part. 
And then you can immediately point out people on their good side or lesser evil side that are every bit as bad as the worse or evil side. And they go, oh, well, yeah, well, you know, I mean, well, politicians are corrupt and, uh, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, they're not the real ones. You know, this guy's the real one. And you'll say, yeah, but that guy did this and that. And they'll go, yeah, yeah, but the other side's worse. And, and, and it's this, it is, it is just this endless coping mechanism of trying to believe that you know at least a portion of your side is good and everyone else is bad and so it's this this fight between good and evil it's all kabuki theater are there a handful of elected officials in those positions that are trying to do the right thing yes and by design they are vastly hopelessly outnumbered yeah and always will be that's just the reality of government um, and so, uh, you know, that is why I increasingly and, and the progressives figured this out a long time ago. It doesn't matter who gets elected as long as the bulk of the people want what you want. And so the progressives have sold even to self-described conservatives and moderates. The vast majority of people want some degree of progressivism. Some want a lot more, some want a little bit less. Uh, but they all want some degree or almost everyone wants some degree of progressivism. They want government to protect them or to keep them safe or to provide things to them that they need. In other words, steal from them and then give some of it back to them if they see that they deserve it. But like most people want this, even some of the people out there are going, I'm a constitutional conservative and I'll be I'll be darned if I'm going to let the liberals come after my Social Security and Medicare. Like they literally have been so sold on the Ponzi scheme that they believe that they're fighting for less government while simultaneously fighting for more government. And so the progressives figured out a long time ago, doesn't matter who gets elected, as long as the vast majority of the people, or at least the loudest plurality of the people, want what we want, then we win. It doesn't matter. And so I took a page out of their book and said, I want people's primary goal to be respected as an individual and to see the scam for what it is and to not want it anymore. To recognize that when the government says, I'm going to give you something, what they really mean is I'm going to take from you, make you dependent on me and give some of it back to you with strings. When they say I'm going to protect you, what they really mean is I'm going to make sure things are bad and then give you just enough protection to have an illusion of safety while primarily using it to control you. Like anytime they say they're doing something good for good, they're primarily do- putting you in a bad position and then alleviating it just enough to keep you dependent on them in everything. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of bypassing the political process and going straight to using these causes, these glaring examples of abuse of government and showing that this is the feature of this system and that the only way it's ever going to change is if we say, no, I want to be respected as an individual. I do not want you to take from me. I do not want you to order me around. I do not want you to harm me or to coerce me. I want you to treat me the same way I would expect you to treat me if you weren't in that position in government. And so, no, I don't want any of your promises or your lies or anything else. I want to be left alone. I want to be treated as an individual, and I want to treat you as an individual. And if that becomes the overriding prevailing sense in this country, then it doesn't matter who gets elected because the people are going to cry out for and demand to be respected as individual human beings. And whether it's, it really will not matter whether they're Libertarian Party or Republican or Democrat or you know, whatever RFK's American values or Green or what, or some party we've never heard of or, uh, you know, write-ins, whatever, it doesn't matter. If that's what the people want, if enough of us want it, that's what they will get. We've, uh, you, you've touched a little bit on You Are the Power, but I'd love to go into some examples because I learned a little bit about it when I yeah. saw you in Utah and I, I was blown away by the stories you shared and yeah. I, I, was, I was angry and people should be angry when they hear these stories. So uh, can, you, can you give a couple examples or, or let's start with one and just go from there. Sure. Yeah, because I, I mean, we could, I have dozens of examples yeah. I can give you. I can give you the one that made me the angriest, I think, of all of them. And this happened towards the end of last year that we first found out about it. We are continuing to fight on it. And I can actually give you the updates on, on where we are with it now. Uh, there are a, are a husband and wife named Matt and Taki Hernandez. Uh, and they have two children, Emma and Aria. Emma, at the time, was a newborn. She was only, a, um, I think, a couple or a few months old. And uh, Emma started, the, the newborn, the baby, 
started experiencing, she would have swelling, she would get really fussy and she looked like she was in pain. Uh, and she would get the swelling like in her legs and I think in her arms as well. And so, uh, they took her to a children's hospital, uh, CHOA children's hospital of Atlanta. And, uh, the doctor looked at her and, and did an x-ray and found that there were small fractures in her legs. And they also did some other blood work to see if there was a, an illness or something causing this. While they were waiting for that, the doctor reported that this was a case of abuse. The police came, they seized Emma, they later came to the Hernandez home where a caseworker reported that the home looked very loving and that there was no signs of neglect or abuse. And so they also seized Aria and then arrested Matt for abuse as a condition of his bond to even be allowed to seek bond so he could get bailed out and go home. He and his wife had to agree not to speak to see or be within a certain number of feet of each other until all of this had been adjudicated, including criminal charges that hadn't even been uh, officially indicted on yet. Hmm. And which meant basically you are le not only have we taken your kids from you, but you are legally estranged from one another indefinitely we have literally ripped your party your 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 family apart so they immediately separately now start trying to get the, the medical records they know that they didn't abuse emma and so they're looking for the medical records they're they're you know uh they're they're trying to get the medical records and they get fought every step of the way defax goes well these aren't your kids anymore and so they literally fight to keep the records from matt and tucky hernandez and I, I believe they even had to get attorneys involved and spend money to fight to get the medical records. They finally get the medical records and they find out why they were fighting against it. Every single bit of evidence demonstrates not only was there no evidence of abuse at all, but that there is all of the evidence shows that Emma has either neonatal rickets or osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, which is both of which can cause minor fractures and other uh, signs of connective tissue issues, connective tissue disorders. It causes breaking. It causes swelling. Uh, it can cause all sorts of stuff, uh, all of which she was or all of which explained the injuries that Emma had and that there was nothing demonstrating any kind of actual concussive force. There was no or, or physical force. There was no sign of abuse whatsoever. And so they thought, OK, great, we have this and now we're going to get our kids back and we'll be able to live together. Right. Nope. They continued on with the with the case. So they said, OK, well, we'll we'll go to court and the judge will see this and the judge will 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 let this you know, we'll see the evidence and say, oh, OK, this was all a uh, you know, case of, of a big mistake. Nope. The judge did not allow the medical experts that their attorneys hired to uh, submit their testimony as evidence. Instead, she took the testimony of a so-called child abuse pediatrician for CHOA, for Children's Hospital of Atlanta, who I believe was not even the uh, doctor who had seen Emma, who was not familiar with the evidence and who said, yeah, in the his his testimony was, yeah, in these cases, um, it's usually abuse. When you see these kinds of injuries, it's usually abuse. Statistically, it's abuse. And when the attorneys asked him for the source of, st of that statistic, he went, yeah, you can see that stuff on the internet. You can look that up on the internet. That was what was allowed. And on the strength of that evidence, of that testimony, they continued to hold the child. Now, they did start to allow uh, limited um, uh, visitations separately by Matt and Tucky. And what they found was that Aria, because Emma's a baby, Emma barely understands what's going on. But Aria was, I believe, three at the time. Hmm. She's old enough to know that something's going on. And she became increasingly depressed and withdrawn. And when she would see them, all she wanted to say, all she would ask is, when am I coming home? Why am I not home? I miss you. Why can't I be with you? And they couldn't answer. They weren't allowed to say any of this. And so they had to say, oh, we're working on it. We're going to get you home as soon as possible. And this heartbroken little toddler got worse and worse and worse. She used to love dancing. She used to love all of these uh, different, you know, uh, extracurricular activities, dancing and music and all this fun stuff that she loved. And she increasingly just would do nothing. Hmm. And it got worse and worse and worse. And what we found out when we first heard this case, first of all, we vetted it heavily because our first impression was, whoa, 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 wait a second. 
you know, let's make sure there isn't any actual abuse or any neglect here because, you know, it's it very easy to say, oh, we've been framed. We did nothing wrong, but let's make sure of it. We reviewed the evidence. Every single bit of evidence demonstrated that there was no sign of abuse and that there was every sign that this was caused by an illness and that every step along the way at every single level the officials involved the family court judge the arresting and investigating officers the um caseworker and the caseworker supervisor uh the child abuse pediatricians uh, the entire division there all of them knew this and moved forward anyway and when we went public with it then other families started coming out of the woodwork not just in georgia across the country hmm. And we realized, and we would vet their causes too, make sure that they're not just coming out and going, yeah, yeah, I didn't do either. And some of the families that came to us turned out we weren't being getting, given the whole story, but a good number of those families, when we saw their evidence, the exact same thing. The kids were chronically ill. They had an illness that was causing this. The, uh, they would try, they would say that they abused, uh, that they were being abused anyway. They would do everything they could to withhold medical evidence. They would railroad them in court. And some of them had their children taken from them. They would actually pressure them and say, listen, you want to be back with your spouse? Give up your kids. You give up your kids and you can live back with your spouse again. May, you'll never have them again, but maybe we'll let you have some supervised remote visitations on holidays. And, you know, you're young. You can have more kids. People were told this. And so we're looking at this and saying, why is this happening? And we're still in the process of finding all the different perverse incentives that are built, built in. But the big one is that the state funding for most of these states is literally, if you call it abuse, you get paid more. And the reason they do it that way is because under section or title four of the social security act, the federal government through the social security administration pays these eight, these uh, departments to call them abuse. When they say this is abuse, they get money. If they then put the children up for foster care, they get even more money. If they then take them permanently from the parents and put them in a permanent placed adoption, they get even more money. And if it turns out that they have a chronic illness, they get even more money. So when these doctors see these kids with signs of chronic illness, they don't think, oh, wow, this kid has a chronic illness. Let's start in, you know, helping treat this child. They go, cha-ching, we're going to make so much money off of this. This is child trafficking. It is yeah. increasing and it is widespread. It is in probably every state, but certainly in most of them. And so we are not only are we working to help these individual families that we're coming across, but we're also working with legislators and with activists and with attorneys to find the root causes here and to work on model legislation that removes the perverse funding incentive that encourages these these uh, officials to call cases abuse and then railroad the uh, railroad the uh, the parents and try to steal the children from them. Uh, and to also reintroduce due process. Starting sometime, we believe, in the 1970s or 80s, they took child abuse out of criminal courts and put them in family courts or, or took the component of deciding whether or not to take the kids out of criminal courts and put them in family courts because they said, well, it's not really a punishment. Hmm. Taking a child from a parent is probably about the worst punishment that you can do to a loving parent, a loving, innocent parent. Yeah. And so even if whether it's going to be in family court or whether it's going to go back to the criminal court, we need to reintroduce that standard, that threshold of standard for evidence and that due process that would come with a criminal uh, proceeding. Now, with this family, the particular this particular family, here's what's happened since we've gotten involved. That judge that wasn't allowing the uh, the um, the medical experts to submit testimony and was basically railroading uh, the Hernandez family after thousands of people began emailing her and contacting her and mentioning her on social media on a regular basis, telling her to do the right thing. For some miraculous reason, she did a complete 180. She started allowing the evidence. She started saying that the goal here is to reunify the children with the parents and, uh, and most recently has uh, actually um, had a defects, the department of vision of, of children and family services, who we've also had people contacting, drop the charges and completely remove this entire case from the family court system. So now the children 
are back, are living with family and Matt and Tucky are allowed to visit them with no restrictions at all. Now, they're not allowed to live in the home yet because the criminal charges haven't been dropped yet, but we're still working on that. But in the criminal side, the judge allowed for a uh, modification of the bond. And after uh, nearly a year of being apart, Matt and Tucky Hernandez are living together as husband and wife. That is what happens when you or the power gets involved in these causes. And we're not going to stop until that family is completely reunified. And not only that, not only all these other families, we're going to get them reunified, but we're also going to fix it at its cause and make it so that this stops happening. Yeah, you mentioned tra child trafficking, and it doesn't sound like you're being hyperbolic at all. That sounds like de facto child trafficking. I mean, you're taking children for profit. That's the only reason why you're doing it. It is the taking of children from innocent parents and giving them to other people in exchange for money illegally, because in all of these things, they're violating all their their rules and procedures like this is it's not like this is legal. They just get away with it because they do it under the color of law and basically everyone's in on it. But they are illegally taking children from innocent parents and giving them to other people in exchange for money. And it's the government doing it. What kind of conditions are the children living in while they're separated from their parents? So usually they're living in, in decent foster care families. But in the case of Georgia, we don't actually know all of their conditions. Um, but we know we have seen some uh, leaked emails that came to us. They have so many children that are in the system that they lost 2,000 of them in the last five years. That's insane. Now, most of those lost kids are kids that graduated out they turned 17 or 18 whatever the cutoff is and so they just stop seeing what's going on with them because they technically aren't children anymore so instead of you know taking them back to their parents or seeing if they need help now that they're legally adults they just stopped are they being sex trafficked god forbid are they uh you know uh living on the streets did they get you know, their lives together and they're in call. We have no idea. They literally do not know where they are. They don't even know if they're in the state and not all of them graduated out. Some of them were still children and they just don't know where they are. Now we saw other leaked emails where they have so many kids and they have so, they have a reducing number of foster families because these foster families, when they, in fact, we actually found out about the Hernandez family from one of the foster families that was watching the kids. And they went to defects and said, something's wrong here. I don't think these kids are being abused. And when I look up the, the, the parents' name, I saw them on social media and they're posting pictures of all this medical evidence. And defects' response to them is, your services will no longer be required. And so more and more good foster families are saying, I don't want anything to do with this. This isn't right. And so what's happening now is we saw where probably well-intentioned uh, um, uh, defects workers and social workers are putting these kids in their offices and putting them in hotel rooms and asking people to check on them occasionally to make sure they're okay. There are 12 and 13 and 14 year olds who don't know where their parents are who were told that their parents are harming them and are living in a hotel room by themselves or living on the floor or in a cot inside of an office building. This is egregious and disgusting and almost unbelievable. Yeah. Like if I wasn't as involved in how terrible the government is and someone told me this, like just the, uh, the average normal person out there walking around is told this, their first reaction is either, I don't believe it, or this must be just some kind of rare rogue aberration. No, this is the system. And what's also happening on the flip side, because they're primarily looking for, you know, parents to frame and, and, you know, these chronically ill children that they can maximize their funding on. A lot of actually abused children aren't being helped because those cases are harder. Yeah. Because of actually abusive parents, the ones that aren't stupid are trying to hide it, right? They'll tell their kids, don't tell anyone. They'll, they'll you, know, uh, you know, hit them in places where it's not as visible and things like that. They'll do things uh, to try, or they'll, they'll you know, constantly move between states so it's harder to build a case on them. They'll do things to try to hide it, or they'll just, in general, make it harder. If the police come, they won't talk to them. They'll say, oh, I know my rights. I'm not going to talk with you. Whereas these innocent parents, they say, I'll talk to anyone. I just want my kids back. They don't yeah. realize they're actually building the case against them. And so 
you know, predators typically look for the easiest prey and these innocent families are the easiest prey. And so not only are innocent children being trafficked and innocent parents and innocent families being torn apart, sometimes permanently, but actual abusive parents are being ignored. Actual children that are being abused very often, they don't find out about it until it's too late. And then you have, again, other children that are literally in the foster care system and they lose them. It is as just about as egregious of a system as it can be. And it's not a lack of funding. They are lousy with money. And it's not a lack of personnel. They are lousy with personnel. It is because they are literally funding them to do it the just about the worst way possible. Yeah. After I heard you speak in Utah, somebody else mentioned the documentary, Take Care of Maya. I watched that with my girlfriend that night. And it was, I mean, these are the kinds of stories you're talking about. And in that case, you know, the mother committed suicide. And it's, it's insane that this is the system that we live in. And the court's involvement is really frustrating because so many people see the courts. We see the politics and we think it's all horrible, but people trust the courts to do the right thing, to be neutral on these things. And there's this whole infrastructure of business going on around children and, and it's facilitating child trafficking Yep. and the courts are com- complicit in it. It's insane yep. to me. Yeah. And not only are they complicit, but eventually we're going to win. Eventually we're going to make these changes. We're going to, uh, you know, change the structure. It is almost certain that none of these people are truly going to be held accountable. They're not going to be fired because that's just the nature of government. And uh, they're not going to be sued because uh, all the government workers, the social workers and supervisors and all that, they all are going to get qualified immunity. And the judges and the the uh, the so-called advocate attorneys, which are basically the, the prosecutors in this case, uh, they get absolute immunity. Pro- prosecutors and politicians and judges get absolute immunity. Um, although qualified immunity at this point, the way the, the court's uh, uh, adjudicate qualified immunity. It might, it's basically absolute immunity under another name. It's very hard to, uh, break immunity for a a government worker. You know, we hear a lot about it from, you know, dealing with cops, but it's, it's, if you work for the government, uh, and you violate someone's constitutional rights, uh, it is nigh impossible for you to actually be held accountable for it. Um, and in, in a civil court, um, and so the best thing that will likely happen, the best case scenario for these families is that they'll be reunited and they might band together and sue the state and they'll probably get some major taxpayer funded settlement. And I'm, I will be happy for them that they're getting some kind of recompense, but I'll also be frustrated that it's the taxpayers paying for yeah. it, including them, their taxpayers. So they're, they're getting, you know, a little bit more than they paid in, obviously, but, uh, but it will be all of us as taxpayers paying for the intentional, not the failures, the intentional malicious actions of government officials. That is what a protection racket that is bigger than anyone that can stop it looks like. But the beauty of this is, and this is why I call my organization, You Are the Power. The power actually lies in us. We've been fed this lie that that there's such a thing as government power. There is what the government is willing to enforce against us and what we are willing to tolerate. And so when the people, when a significant enough number of people, doesn't even need to be the majority, even just a large and insistent minority of people say, I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I demand to be respected as an individual human being. I know that you're going to make things difficult for me. I do not care because I would rather fight as a free person than, you know, uh, live in comfort as your, as your, uh, you know, your, your surf and hope that I never get the worst of your wrath. If enough of us do that, they can't effectively enforce these things. They can't effectively keep it going, especially if people then, uh, you know, uh, demand it from public officials. And I'm not talking about, you know, voting for this party or this candidate. I mean, on every front, whether it's voting or, or, um, or, or activism or, you know, their, their, uh, financial and economic choices and so forth. If everything is geared towards saying, I want to be left alone. I want to be respected as an individual human being. I see 
what happens when you don't respect me and don't respect others as an individual human being. I see your scam for what it is, and I don't want to be a part of it anymore. When enough of us say that, they effectively cannot do it to us anymore. They can try, they can ramp up the, the brutality and the cruelty, but that's the beginning of the end for them. Because the more brutal and cruel and, ov- and overt with that brutality and cruel- cruelness that they, that they are, the more people join our side. The more people go, oh, okay, you are what they said you were. And so yeah. while they may temporarily be able to hold on to power, eventually uh, they're giving up the game themselves. They can no longer have a big smile on their face and send out friendly letters saying, your business matters to you. Make sure you're paying us. They have to actually start being mean. And the meaner they are, the more people realize the sham for what it is. And so that's the beginning of the end for them. And what ends up happening over time is that that government learns to respect us. That government learns to treat us as an individual human being. And we learn that we don't need that government to be anywhere near as big or as intrusive or as involved in our lives or as expensive as it has been. So we end up with a much smaller government that, you know, whatever role it has is to affirm, respect, and defend us as individual human beings. And that is it. Life, liberty, and property. And that's it. I'm happy you mentioned all the different ways we have power because I think we've been conditioned as a nation to believe that our, the extent of our power is at the ballot box. I mean, it's, yep. it's just beat into our skulls constantly. Yep. That's, that's where you make the difference is the voting box. And it's like, no, it's way bigger than that. It's, it's what we do collectively to resist the government overreach and to push back on it. So I love that. We have, and, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we have reunited families because th- thousands of people sent out an email and made some mentions on social media and left some comments on a, on a, you know, a Facebook post or an Instagram post. We have stopped governments from stealing people's property because of a handful, a couple dozen people showing up to a council meeting. We have stopped police from threatening charities with arrest for feeding people by simply having a few people show up and say, this isn't acceptable. People need help. And if people want to voluntarily help people and help them get back on their feet, we shouldn't be stopping them. It is incredible how much power we have. And it's interesting because you mentioned, you know, they tell us that our only real power lies in voting. Well, not only is that not true, but that's actually not a very powerful way of, mm-hmm. of, of uh, especially when they, when they so rig the options for who you can even vote for in the first place. But even if they didn't, even if they left it wide open, that's just the tip of the tip of the iceberg of what you can actually be doing. Um, We are essentially, this is a revolution. It is an entirely peaceful revolution. It's a revolution where we ask people not to use mean words or swear at these officials. Like we're, we're trying to do this as politely and kindly as we can. uh, Although we can't control how people respond, but it is a revolution all the same. It's a revolution of how we look at the situation we're in, the revolution of how we look at government officials and how we interact with them and how they interact with us. It is a revolution that is really just a return to the same form that we have with the default that we have with everyone else, a built in, intrinsic, unspoken, but demanded and expected expectation of being respected and respecting others as individual human beings. Now, when it comes to government, it's not going to be unspoken, at least not for now. People are going to have to actually say, I demand to be respected as an individual human being. That's where what we do comes in. But you have so much more power than you realize. You know, when people join you where the power and they send out a few emails and then they get the updates on how when they and hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of others sent out those same emails and major changes happened, or when they hear that literally a couple dozen people showed up to a city council meeting and demanded that they back off of some terrible corrupt action that they were doing, and then they do it. They actually do back off. People realize, you know, when I say you're the power, I'm not blowing smoke. You have so much more power than you realize, but you have to understand what the problem is. You have to understand the root of it, and then you have to demand a change, and that change is to be respected as an individual human being. You mentioned this in Utah, and I can't remember the number. How many calls or uh, letters and emails to a congressman does it take to oh, yeah. to uh, actually get them to look into something? 
Yeah, so this is U.S. Congress. And uh, my, uh, uh, I'm now name dropping here. My good friend, Justin Amash, the uh, the former 10, uh, yeah, 10 term, no, five term, 10 year congressman uh, uh, from, um, from Michigan. Um, he told me that, and I guess it, it's not worth me saying guess because you already know in the audience, I guess the, while I'm saying this, the audience can guess how many it would take for a U.S. congressperson, a U.S. representative, in Washington, D.C., on Capitol Hill, to take an issue seriously, how many emails they would have to get to take it seriously? Eight. <sighs> Eight emails yeah. is enough for them to say, I need to look into this. Now, if it's something like, you know, whether or not to fund uh, you know, the, the, the military aid to Ukraine or some major issue like that, you're also up against some major lobbying efforts. And, yeah. and, you know, so I'm not pretending like, you know, eight emails will change every single congressperson, but it certainly makes them look at it. And on those major issues, a few dozen or a couple hundred is often enough to change their mind or at least greatly impact how they're looking at it. But on issues where there isn't like, you know, where, where they don't necessarily know much about it, eight. Yeah, he has he has known firsthand multiple times of uh, of Congress people voting against their party on a major issue because like a dozen or so people emailed them in their uh, of their constituents emailed them and told them about it. Yeah, that's in that's not state rep or city council. That's U.S. Congress. So if yeah. eight emails can change things in Congress. Imagine what your one email can do to a city councilman or a family court judge or a, uh, um, a, uh, a caseworker or someone on a zoning board. In fact, you don't have to imagine because if you go to you or the power of social media or to mine, you can see endless, many, many, many examples of exactly what happens when you send that email or you make that phone call or you send that text message or you show up to that council meeting. It changes everything. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't remember the number and eight was going through my head and I'm like, I, I have to be remembering the wrong number. It has to be nope, it was eight. or something. Yeah. Eight. That's <laughs> it insane. Was eight. You guys are, you have, you try to place people in courts to help people and stuff like that. I'm just wondering, have you, are you considering using AI to uh, facilitate that a bit? Like you can build a chat bot with voice capability to listen in and, give some kind of legal guidance in those situations? Has that been explored at all? We haven't yet only because we are, we're focusing instead on building a good network of mm. no cause, you know, pro bono and sliding scale and, and effective attorneys that can help with that stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm concerned about, especially when it comes to legal stuff, uh, using AI for that. Um, yeah. because that could potentially create, you know, legal pitfalls. And also we, as the organization try to stay out of the legal side of that, um, mm. that opens up a whole different can of worms. We would rather work with partners who do the legal side of that and focus on the activism and messaging side of that. Uh, right. we've also, uh, started, um, uh, we've started partnering, uh, in Georgia and we hope to expand this, uh, partnering with like people that provide uh, therapy and counseling, because I mean, the trauma that these families and these people that go through these horrific things, the things that they go through long after we're able to help them, they're still crumbling after this, just the, the, the PTSD, the trauma of having your own government weaponized against you and try to destroy your family or take your home or, you know, whatever terrible thing that they did wrongfully arrest you and then try to hide the body cam footage. You know, we've dealt with all this stuff. And, uh, and so, you know, we've started working on that as well. But on anything outside of the the messaging and activism and advocacy, we try to partner with people that do that and and work with them so that we can all work together so that when they have caught, you know, people they're working with on that end, we can help on the activism and messaging. We'd rather kind of stay focused on what we do than try yeah. to become a jack of all trades and a master of none. And especially when it comes to the legal stuff, because that does open a giant can of worms. Um, we are increasingly streamlining our biggest uh, and uh, use of uh, of of manpower and and uh, man hours on on the work we do is vetting these causes because mm -hmm. we want to make sure if we're going public with this cause and we're trying to get you know 
millions of people to see it and thousands or tens of thousands to join us. We want to make sure it's true. Yeah. And, you know, I, a lot of stuff that's brought to us is not true. Like we, we, we read about it and it's this terrible tear jerker story and we start looking into it and it's like, that's not true. That's not what happened. Or yeah, this part may have happened, but you left out this and this and this and this, and suddenly they don't look like the bad guys and you don't look like the good guy anymore. And we certainly yeah. don't want to be, you know, uh, out there promoting causes and trying to encourage people to rally around causes, uh, for people that, that we should not be helping, not just because it's a misuse of those resources, but eventually people aren't going to trust us either. And they shouldn't trust us if we're doing that. So we have made a point of, you know, we want to make sure beyond a shadow. I mean, you want to talk about a, a standard of evidence. We want to make sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that the people that we're working on, that we're helping are, you know, innocent and are being harmed uh, and that there is no missing context or anything. But yeah, any kind of legal stuff, we try to partner with legal people, attorneys and stuff that, that do that kind of stuff. Are there any books that have been written about this kind of stuff, the stuff going on where people can get more information on it? I know when it comes to libertarianism, uh, yeah. you actually like books like uh, How to Win in Friends and Influence People and things like that. Yeah. But as, as far as the corruption, this specific type of corruption like the Hernandezes are experiencing, are there any books or anything that people can read that explore this? That you know there of? may be. There are none that I'm aware of, um, okay. but I know many people have talked. I mean, there are journalists who have done endless efforts talking about what is essentially what they call medical kidnapping. Yeah. And at this point, it's going beyond medical kidnapping. It's just straight up kidnapping. They're looking for any pretext to kidnap, uh, even across state lines. I mean, you want to talk about trafficking. It is trafficking. I don't know offhand of a publication. That documentary you were talking about, Take Care of Maya, about the case in Florida, the Kowalski family, that is a, 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 a horrific example. Uh, of exactly yeah. what we're talking about. Uh, in what we are doing, uh, when it comes to the activism end of it, when you become a member of You Are the Power, uh, you get access to all of our free training um, on uh, the you know how to find these causes, how to do the activism, the ABCs behind the principle of human respect, how to talk about it, how to apply it in your daily life, how to apply it in the activism that you do and in your messaging. Um, so we're writing the book on what it is, the ABCs of what we do. Um, but in terms of a book specifically on these things, I'm sure there probably is one, but there's none that I'm aware of. Okay. Well, uh, I signed up for, uh, you are the power for Thank the free you. membership right before this. Actually, I've been meaning to, and I was like, right before I get on the interview, I better have that done. And I, I hope well, every you. listener does that, but I want to hand it over to you, um, to share where people can go to find you are the power, anything else you want to share and yeah, anything you want to share. Yeah, if you would like to be a part of You Are The Power, we'd love to have you. Um, if you go to youarethepower.net, you can become a member today. Um, if you are in a position to be able to give, uh, there is a lot of effort and resources that have to go into the work that we do. Um, and so anything that you're able to give, we would love to, to do it. But we, more than anything, we'd love for you to be a member. We'd love to be you to be a part of this grassroots army that, uh, that we are building. When you become a member... Uh, you will be connected with your regional organizer. And if your state has an organizer with your state organizer, we're less than, we're about two years old, so we're still growing. Um, so not every state has an organizer, but every region does. Uh, you will also then be invited to download our app, which will notify you of uh, upcoming causes and calls to action, and as well as updates on existing causes directly through push notifications on your phone. Uh, kind of streamlines the process there. Uh, you also get get points when you participate in our calls to action. You can use those points towards discounts at our merchandise store. Uh, it unlocks certain rewards like thank you videos and all sorts of fun stuff. We're going to be building that out more uh, as that goes on. We literally just launched the app. Uh, and there are many other tools that are coming, like the free training uh, that we have and, and many other things that can uh, get you as involved in this uh, movement as you would like to be. So if you'd like to do that, go to youarethepower.net, become a member today. Um, and if you'd like to follow the stuff that I am doing personally, uh, including the things that I do with You Are The Power, you can find me on all social media. You can find me on the everything. I'm on Facebook, the X, Twitter, whatever, YouTube. I uh, have, I'm on Rumble. I'm on TikTok. I'm uh, Instagram. I'm on all the different stuff. Uh, and if you want to see any upcoming events that I'm going to be at, uh, if you go to spikecohen.com, all my uh, my event schedule is listed there. Uh, next week, I will be, well, I'm not sure when this is airing, but 
uh, from January 19th to the 22nd, I will be in, or the 20th to the 22nd, I will be at Pork Fest in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, then f- uh, in July, the beginning, I'm forgetting the dates, but in July, beginning of July, I will be in uh, Las Vegas for Freedom Fest. And then uh, the beginning of August, I will be in Orlando for uh, YALCON, which is Young Americans for Liberties convention that they have every year. Uh, and for all the details on uh, on those events and how you can register and everything else, if you go to spikecohen.com, uh, you can get all that. Awesome. Thank you, Spike. It, it's been amazing Thank talking you. to you. I love the work that you're doing. I really respect it. And I hope it just grows and people get more power. So that well, thank you, Artie. We are corruption. that much closer to it with you being a member. So thank you. Awesome. It's been a pleasure speaking to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on X at RDTM podcast and Instagram at thoughtfully mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.